Chapter 15 of Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The door of the car swung wide, and Ortiz's pale, grim face peered in behind the blue steel barrel of his automatic. He smiled queerly as Jameson, with a grunt of relief, tapped Bell's wrist in sign to put away his weapon. Ah, very well, said Ortiz with the same queer smile upon his face. One moment. He disappeared. On the instant, there was the thunderous crashing of a weapon. Bell started up, but Jameson thrust him back. Then Ortiz appeared again, with smoke still trickling from the barrel of his pistol. I have just done something that I have long wished to do, he observed coolly. I have killed the chauffeur and his companion. You may alight now. I believe we will have half an hour or more. It will do excellently. He offered his hand to Paula as she stepped out. She seemed to shudder a little as she took it. I do not blame you for shuddering, senorita, he said politely, but men who are about to die may indulge in petty spites, and the chauffeur was a favorite with the deputy for whom I am substituting. Like all favorites of despots, he had power to abuse, and he abused it. I could tell you tales, but refrain. The car had come to a stop in what seemed to be a huge warehouse, and by the sound of water round about it, it was either near or entirely built out over the harbor. A large section near the outer end was walled off. Boxes, bales, parcels, and packages of every sort were heaped all about. Bell saw crated air engines lying in a row against one wall. There were a dozen or more of them. Machinery, huge cases of foodstuffs. The Buenos Aires Depot, said Ortiz almost gaily. This was the point of receipt for all the manufactured goods which went to the fazenda of Cuyaba, Senor Bell. Since you destroyed that place, it has not been so much used. However, it will serve excellently as a tomb. There are cases of hand grenades yonder. I advise you to carry a certain number with you. The machine guns for the aircraft, with their ammunition, are here. He was hurrying them toward a great walled-off space as he talked, his automatic serving as a pointer, when he indicated the various objects. Now here, he added, as he unlocked the door, is your vessel. The master bought only amphibian planes of late, those for Cuyaba were assembled in this little dock and took off from the water. Your destruction up there, Senor Bell, left one quite complete but undelivered. I think another crated. Is still in the warehouse. I have been very busy, but if you can fuel and load it before we are attacked. They were in a roofed and walled but floorless shed built into the warehouse itself. Water surged about below them, and on it floated a five-passenger plane, fully assembled and apparently ready to fly, but brand new and so far unused. I'll look it over, said Bell briefly. He swung down the catwalk, painted on the wings. He began a swift and hasty survey. Soot on the exhaust stacks proved that the motors had been tried at least. Everything seemed trim and new, and glistening in the cabin. The fuel tanks showed the barest trace of fuel. The oil tanks were full to their filling plugs. He swung back up. Taking a chance, of course, he said curtly. If the motors were all right when they were tried, they're probably all right now. They may have been tuned up and may not. I tried the controls, and they seemed to work. For a new ship, of course, a man would like to go over it carefully. But if we've got to hurry... I think, said Ortez, and laughed, that haste would be desirable. Herr Viedkind, no, amigo mio, it was that damned Antonio Callas who listened to us last night. I found pencil marks beside the listening instrument. He must have sat there and eavesdropped upon me many weary hours, and scribbled, as men do, to pass the time. He had a pretty taste in monograms. 
I gave all the orders that were needful for you to take off from the flying field. I even went there myself and gave additional orders, and Callus was there too, also others of the master's subjects. My treason would provoke a terrible revenge from the master, so they thought to prove their loyalty by permitting me to disclose my plan and foil it at its beginning. I would have made the journey with you to the master, but as a prisoner, with the tale of my treason written out. So I returned and changed the orders to the chauffeur, when all the master's loyal subjects were waiting at the flying field. But soon it will occur to them what I have done. They will come here. Therefore hasten. We want food, said Bell evenly, and arms, but mostly we want fuel. We'll get busy. He shed his coat and picked up a hand truck. He rammed it under a drum of gasoline and ran it to the walkway nearest to the floating plane. Coiled against the wall, there was a long hose with a funnel at its upper end. In seconds, he had the hose end in one of the wing fuel tanks. In seconds more, he had propped the funnel into place and was watching the gasoline gurgling down the hose. Paula, he said curtly, watch this. When it's empty, roll the drum away so I can put another in its place. She moved quickly beside it, throwing him a little smile. She said absorbedly about her task. Jameson arrived with another drum of gas before the first was emptied, and Bell was there with the third while the second still gurgled. They heaped the full drums in place, and Jameson suddenly abandoned his truck to swear wrathfully and tear off his spectacles and fling them against the wall. The bushy eyebrows and beard peeled off. His coat went down. He began to rush loads of foodstuffs, arms, and other objects to a point from which they could be loaded on the plain. Ortiz pointed out the things he pantingly demanded. In minutes, it seemed, he was demanding, How much can we take? Any more than that? No more, said Bell. All the weight we can spare goes for fuel. See if you can find another hose and funnel and get to work on the other tank. I'm going to rustle oil. He came staggering back with heavy drums of it. A thought struck him. How do we get out? What works the harbor door? Ortiz pointed, smiling. A button, senor, and a motor does the rest. He looked at his watch. I had better see if my fellow subjects have come. He vanished, smiling his same queer smile. Bell worked frantically. He saw Ortiz coming back, pausing to light a cigarette, and taking up a hatchet with which he attacked the packing case. They are outside, senor, he called. They have found the signs of the car entering, and now are discussing. He plucked something carefully from the packing box and went leisurely back toward the door. Bell began to load the food and stores into the cabin, with sweat streaming down his face. There was the sound of a terrific explosion, and Bell jumped savagely to solid ground. Keep loading, I'll hold them back, he snapped to Jameson. But when he went pounding to the back of the warehouse, he found Ortiz laughing. A hand grenade, senor, he said, in wholly unnatural levity. Among the subjects of the master, I believe that I am going mad to take such pleasure in destruction. But since I am to die so shortly, why not go mad, if it gives me pleasure? He peered out of a tiny hole and aimed his automatic carefully. It spurted out all the seven shots that were left. The man who poisoned me, he said pleasantly, I think he's dead. Go back and make ready to leave, then your bell, because they will probably try to storm this place soon, and then the police will come, and then... It is amusing that I am the one man to whom those enslaved among the city authorities would look for the master's orders. Bell stared out. He saw a small horde of people, frantically agitated, milling in the cramped and unattractive little street of Buenos Aires' waterfront. Sheer desperation seemed to impel them, desperation and a frantic fear. They surged forward, and Ortiz flung a hand grenade. 
Its explosion was terrific, but he had perhaps purposely flung it short. Bell suddenly saw police uniforms fighting away through to the front of the crowd and the source of all this disturbance. Go back, said Ortiz seriously. I shall die, Senor Bell. There is nothing else for me to do. But I wish to die with Latin melodrama. He managed to smile. I will give you ten minutes more. I can hold off the police themselves for so long. But you must hasten, because there are police launches. He held out his hand. Bell took it. Good luck, said Ortiz. You can come, began Bell, wrenched by the gaiety on Ortiz's face. Absurd, said Ortiz, smiling. I should be murder mad within three days. This is a preferable death, I assure you. Ten minutes, no more. And Bell went racing back and found Jameson rolling away the last of the fuel drums, and Paula looking anxiously for him. Tanks full, said Jameson curtly. Everything's set. What next? Engine, said Bell. He swung down and jerked the prop over, again and again. The motor caught. He went plunging to the other. Minutes. They caught. He throttled them down to the proper, warming up roaring, while the air in the enclosed space grew foul. Once more to the warehouse, Ortiz shouted and waved his hand. He was filling his pockets with hand grenades. But made a gesture of farewell, and Ortiz seemed to smile as he went back to hold the entrance for a little longer. We're going, said Bell grimly. Get your guns ready, Jameson, for when the door goes up. He pressed on the button Ortiz had pointed out. There were more explosions and the rattle of firearms from the front of the warehouse. There was a sudden rumble of machinery and the blank front of the little covered dock rose suddenly. The sunlit waters of Buenos Aires Harbor spread out before them. To Bell, who had not looked on sunlight that day, the effect was dazzling. He blinked and then saw a fast little launch approaching. There were uniformed figures crowded about its bows. All said, he snapped, I'm going to give her the gun. Go to it, said Jameson. Where? The motors bellowed and drowned out the rest. The plane shuddered and began to move. The sound of explosions from the back of the warehouse was loud and continuous now. Out in the bright sunlight, the plane moved, at first heavily, then swiftly. Bell saw arms waving wildly in the launch with the uniformed men. Sunlight glittered suddenly on rifle barrels. Puffs of vapor shot out. Something spat through the wall beside Bell, but the roaring of the motors kept up, and the pounding of the waves against the curved bow of the boat body grew more and more violent. Sweat came out on Bell's face. The ship was not lifting. But it did lift, slowly, very slowly, carrying every pound with which it could have risen from the water. It swept past the police launch at ninety miles an hour, but no more than five feet above the waves. A big clumsy tramp, flying the Norwegian flag, splashed upriver with its propeller half out of water. Bell dared to rise a little, so he could bank and dodge it. He could not rise above it. He had one glimpse of blonde, astonished beards staring over the stern of the tramp as he swept by it, his wingtips level with its rail and barely twenty feet away. And then he went on and on, out to sea. He began to spiral for height fully four miles offshore and looked back at the sprawling city. Down by the waterfront, a thick, curling mass of smoke was rising from one spot abutting on the water. It swayed aside, and Bell saw the rectangular opening out of which the plane had come. Ortiz is in there, he said, sick at heart, dying as he planned. But there was a sudden upheaval of timbers and roof, a colossal burst of smoke, a long time later, the concussion of a vast explosion. There was nothing left where the warehouse had been. Bell looked and swore softly to himself and felt the fresh surge of the hatred he bore to the master and all his works. And then filmy clouds loomed up, 
but a little above the rising plain, and Bell shot into them and straightened out for the south. For many long hours the plane floated on to the southward, high above a gray ocean which seemed deceptively placid beneath a canopy of thin clouds. The motors roared steadily in the main, though once Bell instructed Jameson briefly in the maintenance of a proper course and height, and swung out into the terrific blasts of air that swept past the wings. He clung to the struts and handholds, and made his way out on the catwalk to make some fine adjustments in one motor, with six thousand feet of empty space below the swaying wing. Carburetor wrong, he explained, when he had closed the cabin window behind him again, and the motor's roar was once more dulled. It was likely to make a lot of carbon in the cylinders. Okay, now. Paula's hand touched his shyly. He smiled abstractedly at her and went back to the controls. And then the plane kept on steadily. Time and space had become purely relative in these days, in startling verification of Mr. Einstein. And the distance between Buenos Aires and Magellan Strait is great or small, a perilous journey or a mere day's travel, according to the mind and the transportation facilities of the voyager. Before four o'clock in the afternoon, the coast was low and sandy to the westward, and it continued sterile and bare for long hours while the plane hung high against the sky with a following wind driving it on vastly more swiftly than its own engines could have contrived. It was a little before sunset when the character of the shore changed yet again, and the sun was low behind a bank of angry clouds when the stubby forefinger of rock that Magellan optimistically named the Cape of the Eleven Thousand Virgins reached upward from the seemingly placid water. Bell swept lower then, much lower, looking for a landing place. He found it eight or nine miles farther on, on a wide sandy beach some three miles from a lighthouse. The little plane splashed down into the tumbling sea, and half supported by the waves and half by the lift remaining to its wings, ran for yards up upon the hard-packed sand. The landing had been made at late twilight, and Bell moved swiftly when he rose from the pilot's seat. I'm going over to that lighthouse, he said curtly. There won't be enough men there to be dangerous, and they probably haven't frequent communication with the town. I'll learn something anyway. You two stay with the plane. Jameson lifted his eyebrows and was about to speak, but looked at Bell's expression and stopped. Leadership is everywhere, a matter of emotion and brains together, and though Jameson had his share of brains, he had not Bell's corroding, withering passion of hatred against the master and all who served him gladly. All the way down the coast, Bell had been remembering things he had seen of the master's doing. His power was solely that of fear, and the deputies of his selection had necessarily been men who had spread that terror with an unholy zest. The nature of his hold upon his subjects was such that no honorable man would ever serve him willingly, and for deputies he had need of men even of enthusiasm. His deputies, then, were men who found in the assigned authority of the master full scope for the satisfaction of their own passions. And Bell had seen what those passions brought about, and there was a dull flame of hatred burning in his eyes that would never quite leave them until those men were powerless and the master dead. "'You'll look after the ship and Paula,' said Bell impatiently. "'All right?' Jameson nodded. Paul looked appealingly at Bell, but he had become a man with an obsession. Perhaps the death of Ortiz had cemented it, but certainly he was unable to think of anything now but the necessity of smashing the ghastly hold of the master upon all the folk he had entrapped. Subconsciously, perhaps, Bell saw in the triumph of the master a blow to all civilization. Less vaguely, he foresaw an attempt at the extension of the master's rule to his own nation. 
But when Bell thought of the master, mainly he remembered certain disconnected incidents. The girl at Ribera's luxurious fazenda, outside of Rio, who had been ordered to persuade him to be her lover, on penalty of a horrible madness for her infant son if she failed, of a pale and stricken fazendero on the Rio Lornoco, who thought him a deputy and humbly implored the grace of the master for a moody twelve-year-old girl, of a young man who kept his father murder-mad in a barred room in his house and waited despairingly for that madness to be meted out upon himself and on his wife and children, of a white man who had been kept in a cage in Cuyaba with other men. Bell trudged on through the deepening night with his soul a burning flame of hatred. He clambered amid boulders, guided by the tall lighthouse of Cape Possession, with the little white dwelling he had seen at its base before nightfall. He fell and rose, and forced his way on and upward, and at last was knocking heavily at a trim and neatly painted door. He was so absorbed in his rage that his talk with the lighthouse keeper seemed vague in his memory afterward. The keeper was a wizened little Welshman from Chibut, who spoke English with an extraordinary mixture of Spanish intonation and Cimbrian accent. Bell listened heavily, and spoke more heavily still. At the end, he went back to the plain with a spindle-shanked boy with a lantern accompanying him. All settled, he said grimly, when Jameson came out into the darkness with a ready revolver to investigate the approaching light. We get a boat from the lighthouse keeper to go to Punta Arenas in. He's a devout member of some peculiar sect, and he's seen enough of the hell Punta Arenas amounts to to believe what I told him of its cause. His wife will look after Paula and this boy will hitch a team to the plane and haul it out of sight early in the morning. With the help of God, we'll kill Ribiera and the Master before sunset tomorrow. End of chapter 15